Before starting the video make sure to hit the subscribe button if you are new to my channel, it really motivates me to keep on creating anime recaps for you guys. The story starts with Tuya and his friends fighting a pair of mithril golems. Ye's sword breaks when she attacks the golem, and Tuya thinks that the golems are really tough. Tuya then uses teleportation magic to teleport the golems 10,000 meters above them, and the golems then fall to the ground. They then head towards the golems, and the girls defeat the beaten down golems by using their magic attacks. This completes their mission, and they head back using the gate spell. The maids at their house welcomes them back, and Ran asks Tuya if he managed to defeat the mithril golems, Tuya mentions that he did, and their adventurer rankings also went up. He mentions that Yumina got a blue card, and he got a red card. This makes them top class adventurers, and Cecile then mentions that she has prepared their bathwater. Ren then asks where Francesca is, and Tuya remembers that he left her at the battlefield. Tuya then brings Francesca back, and she mentions that she is not mad at him, but her expressions tell a different story. Francesca mentions that Tuya must get aroused by neglecting others, and Tuya mentions that he doesn't have that kind of fetish. Tuya then apologizes to her, and he mentions that he instinctively used Gate to come back. Lean then tells Francesca to forgive Tuya, as he has already reflected on his actions. Francesca mentions that she will forgive him if he can buy her a pair of sexy lingerie, and Tuya gets flustered hearing this. Francesca then mentions that she was just kidding, and she leaves. Lean mentions that it's amazing how an artificial person can make jokes like that, and she wonders if her programs can do the same thing. Tuya then asks her what brings her here today, and Lean mentions that she is here to talk about the remaining Babylon teleportation array. Tuya is surprised that Lean is looking for Babylon, and she wonders if Tuya doesn't want to. Tuya mentions that he doesn't have any reason to find it and he states that even Professor Babylon mentioned that they don't need such a powerful force in this era. Tuya then tells Lean that he will help her if she can find further information on the teleportation arrays. God then calls Tuya, and he summons him to his place. God mentions that he just wanted to check up on him, and he asks Tuya how things are going. Tuya mentions that they are going fine, and nothing special has happened. The God mentions that his smartphone seems to be working properly as well, and Tuya mentions that it has been a big help to him. He states that he still doesn't know what he should do in the other world, and right now he is just completing quests to earn some money. The goddess of love then asks Tuya why he doesn't set a photo of his fiancé as his wallpaper, and Tuya mentions that it would be too embarrassing if someone else saw it. The goddess of love mentions that it was nice to see him laugh like an idiot while he was buying engagement rings for four people, and Tuya mentions that he was just nervous at that time. Tuya then wonders if she was watching him, and the god mentions that he saw it as well. Tuya thinks that these two have too much free time to kill. The scene changes to the girls bathing at the house, and they are enjoying their relaxing baths. Els then looks at the engagement ring that Tuya gave her, and Yumina wonders if looking at the ring makes her happy. Yumina mentions that it makes her happy as well, and Linza states that the ring is also enchanted with Excel, Teleport, and Storage Magic. Yumina then thinks that Tuya is really powerful, and she mentions that he will definitely use his powers to help people in the future, but she is afraid that someone will take advantage of his power. Els thinks that Tuya is gullible, and he will be fooled easily. Yumina then mentions that there will be more women who will take a liking to Tuya, and become his fiancé in the future, and she is afraid that Tuya might take risks in order to help them. The other girls are surprised to hear that Tuya might have more fiancés and Yumina mentions that for now they need to support him with everything that they have. The scene cuts to Tuya, and Ye ordering a new sword for Ye, and Ye thinks that she couldn't help Tuya with the previous mission, and she thinks that she has to support him from now on. Ye then mentions that since she is Tuya's fiancé she wants to spend more alone time with him, and she wants to hold his hands. This makes Tuya blush, and he holds Ye's hand, and they walk home together. The scene changes to Tuya visiting the castle with Yumina, and the king is glad to hear that Yumina was finally able to win over Tuya's heart. The queen mentions that Yumina needs to do her best in order to support Tuya, and Yumina mentions that she will. Tuya then mentions that he is not going to marry Yumina right now, and he wants to wait until he turns 18. The king doesn't mind, and the queen mentions that formally announcing their marriage to the public might cause some problems. Tuya wonders what she means, and she explains that the nobles who see Yumina as a future wife and daughter-in-law will turn against him, and some people may also try to win him over. If Tuya fails to show any achievements then some people might not even recognize him as Yumina's husband. Su then comes to meet Tuya, 
and Yumina, and they talk with each other. The scene cuts to Tuya and Yumina returning to their house, and Tuya asks Yumina if he will become king once he marries her. Yumina mentions that he will, unless she has a brother in the future, or her uncle has a son. Yumina mentions that the official announcement will still take some time, and it's still too early to talk about it. Tuya then wonders what the queen meant by achievements, and he thinks that he should complete that soon. Tuya then heads to the Silver Moon Inn, and he asks the innkeeper how business has been going lately. The innkeepers mention that it's been really bad, and since this place is not a tourist spot, there aren't many people who come to visit here. Tuya thinks that the inn needs something unique to keep the customers coming back, and he wonders what he should do. Tuya then builds a hot spring in the inn, and the innkeeper thinks that if the guests can use this bath at a cheaper price, they will surely love it. They think that this is going to work, and Tuya suggests that they should invite some acquaintances to test out the hot springs. Tuya then tries out the hot spring, and the girls are also getting ready to take a dip in it. Ye then reads that the hot spring can make their skin smooth, and Yumina mentions that they should show their smooth skins to Tuya after taking a bath. The girls get flustered hearing this, and Yumina then asks them how they fell in love with Tuya. They start with Els, and she mentions that when she met Tuya he treated her like any other girl, and he bought cute clothes for her saying that they suit her. She then began to notice him, and she found herself staring at him unconsciously, and before she knew it she was in love with him. Next is Linz's turn and she mentions that she was not used to talking with boys, but it was different with Tuya, and he asked her to teach him magic. He was patient with her even though her explanations sucked, and she soon began to think of Tuya as a friend. But her chest started to hurt when Tuya brought home Yumina, and she realized that she was in love with him. It is then Ye's turn and she mentions that Tuya is smooth while making dealings, but when it comes to protecting those close to him, he has a firm and unwavering heart, and he thinks that it's natural to help others. They all agree with this, and Yumina mentions that this is why they all fell in love with him. Els then mentions that Yumina should talk about her story as well, and Yumina mentions that when she first saw Tuya she knew that he is going to be her husband. She doesn't know if it was love at first sight or it was because of her mystic eyes, but she knows that she liked him. The others think that it was definitely love at first sight. We then see that Francesca decides to wash Tuya's back, and she tries to climb over the fence to the men's bath, but she is struck by a paralyzing spell and Tuya mentions that he rigged the fence with a paralyzing spell in order to stop people from trying to take a peek. Lean then comes to the men's bath and she mentions that she has located the ruins of Babylon. The story continues, and the group heads to a ruin of Babylon. Lean mentions that the ruins lie in the Rabi desert in the kingdom of Sandora, and she states that they are buried under the sand. Toya doesn't sound interested, and Lean wonders if he is just going to take a casual look at the ruins. Toya mentions that he is, and Lean then hopes that the ruins lead to the library. Toya then remembers that the ancient civilization was destroyed by the phrases, and he thinks that he might need to borrow the power of Babylon in order to fight them. They then notice a phrase chasing a few people, and they engage the phrase. Els then uses wind magic to protect the people from the phrase, and Linza leads them to safety. Ye then asks Toya to teleport her on top of the phrase with his gate spell, and Toya does so and Ye attacks the phrase, but it's no use. The phrase then attacks them, and they dodge. They then think that if they are hit by an attack like that, they will be dead. Ende then comes there, and he mentions that it's been a long time. Ende mentions that he sensed the presence of the phrase so he came to take a look. Todia is surprised to see that Ende knows about phrases, and Ende mentions that he didn't expect an intermediate class to pass through the barrier. Ende then defeats the phrase with a single stomp, and Toya asks him how he did that. Ende mentions that he just used vibrations at the same frequency as the phrase, and Toya asks him what he meant by the barrier. Ende explains that the barrier is kind of like a net, and it protects this world from foreign invasion, but cracks are appearing in the barrier, and the phrases are using them to invade. Ende explains that this phrase was just a soldier searching for the sleeping king, and he then leaves. The scene cuts to Toya and the group providing water to the people they just saved, and the rescued people thank them. The leader of the group introduces herself, as Rebecca an adventurer. Toya thinks that they are not equipped for dessert travel, and Rebecca explains that not all of them are adventurers and some of them are slaves, and they are on a journey to find a way to remove their slave collars. She explains that the collars can only be removed by their master, but he is dead and they are traveling to another country in the hope that they can find someone who can remove the collars. 
Toya then thinks that he might be able to remove their collars, and he uses a port to remove all of their slave collars. Toya then asks them what they are going to do next, and Rebecca mentions that even though their collars have been removed their slave status still remains, and they can't return to the kingdom of Sandora, and she is going to take them to another country. Yumina then asks them if they would like to come to Belfast, and Rebecca wonders who she is. Yumina then introduces herself as the princess of Belfast, and she mentions that her country would be willing to take them in. Rebecca and everyone else then thank Yumina, and Toya teleports them to Belfast. Later Toya tells the rest of the group that Rebecca and her group will be staying at his house for now, and they will make their future plans later. Lean then asks Toya who that man was, and how Toya knows him. Toya explains that his name is Ende, and he met him when he went to buy the engagement rings. He mentions that he saw Ende paying with a strange coin, and he helped him to pay for his crepe. Ende told him that he didn't have any money, and he was looking for a job, so he helped him register at the guild. He states that he didn't expect to see him in the desert, and Francesca then recognizes the coin, and she mentions that it was minted over 5,000 years ago. The others think that the coin doesn't look that ancient, and Lean then thinks that Ende seems suspicious, as he knows about phrases, and he also has a coin from over 5,000 years ago. Toya agrees, and Els then asks him what exactly is a phrase. Toya tells them that he received a message from Dr. Regina Babylon a while ago, and the doctor had a tool that could see into the future, and she used it to watch Toya and the others. But one day the phrases appeared out of nowhere, and they destroyed the place where the doctor was located. The doctor predicted that the world would be destroyed by the phrases, but one day the phrases disappeared suddenly, and the world was spared. Lean asks Toya why he kept such an important thing a secret, and Toya mentions that he couldn't find the right moment to tell them about it. Lean then wonders if the phrases were really so numerous back in the day, then why is it that nobody has witnessed them until now? Toya then mentions that Ende told him that the barrier that protects the world from foreign invasion has cracks, and the phrases pass through them. Toya then asks Francesca if the people fought the phrases 5,000 years ago, and Francesca mentions that they did, and the doctor even developed an ultimate weapon to defeat them, but it was too late and the phrases had already left the world. She explains that the ultimate weapon was a mobile robot called Frame Gear, and it is stored in the hangar of Babylon. Toya is excited to know that the doctor developed a robot, and he hopes that the ruins lead to the hangar. They then arrive at their destination, and Toya notices that there is nothing here. Lean then uses a wind spell to remove the sand and the ruins surface. Toya then enters the ruins, and he notices that he isn't able to use his magic inside them. Toya then thinks that he is trapped, and the teleportation array is the only way out. Toya activates the teleportation array, and he is teleported to another part of Babylon. An AI then welcomes Toya to the workshop of Babylon, and she introduces herself as Rosetta. She mentions that only the Chosen One can enter the workshop, and Toya mentions that he has already been recognized as the Chosen One by Francesca. Rosetta mentions that this simplifies things, and she then states that she will test if he really is the Chosen One. As a test Rosetta asks him to guess the color of her panties without moving from his place. Toya thinks that this is stupid, but he has no choice but to complete the test. He then uses wind magic and fire magic to look at Rosetta's underwear but Rosetta's clothes are resistant to both types of magic. Toya then uses long sense to see through Rosetta's clothes, and he notices that she is not wearing any underwear. Toya then states that her panties are colorless, and Rosetta kisses him to transfer the ownership of the workshop. Rosetta then gives Toya a tour of the workshop, and Toya notices that the workshop is just an empty white room. Rosetta then takes out the control panel, and she mentions that this room can be used to create any tool or production platform. She explains that only her and Toya can operate the workshop, and she states that the workshop can also replicate any original objects, but the corresponding materials will be needed. Toya thinks that he can just use modeling to manufacture anything he wants, but this might help him to mass produce things. Toya then tries to copy his gun with Mithril, and the workshop creates a perfect copy of the gun. Rosetta mentions that he can also change the design of the gun, and Toya notices that the workshop can't copy the program installed in the gun. Toya mentions that he can just reattach the program, and he thinks that the workshop is really convenient as it can also be used to make money. Toya then asks Rosetta about the frame gear, and she mentions that the frame gear was made here, and she also assisted the doctor with its creation. Toya asks Rosetta if she can make the frame gear, 
and Rosetta mentions that she can only make equipment, and they don't even have the blueprints of the frame gear. She mentions that the blueprint is stored in the storehouse, and Toya thinks that his only choice is to either find the hangar or the storehouse. Toya then mentions that he should call everyone over, and he uses Gate to teleport them. Lean is disappointed that they found the workshop instead of the library, and Rosetta mentions that the workshop is far more useful than the Sky Garden. Toya then wonders if they can merge the Sky Garden and the workshop. Francesca mentions that he can, and Toya states that he should first return the garden and the workshop to Belfast and merge there. The scene changes to Toya returning to his house, and Rebecca and her group apologizes to him for not treating him with respect, as he is the fiancé of the princess. Toya mentions that he doesn't mind, and he is not even a noble. He mentions that they don't have to be respectful while talking to him, and the group feels relieved to hear this. Toya asks them what they are planning to do now, and he mentions that the three of them can find work at the guild. Rebecca mentions that she is worried about the slaves, and she wonders if they can stay here until they find some work in the city. Toya mentions that it's fine with him, and he wonders if he can help them somehow. The story continues, and Toya visits the library cafe, Moonreader. The receptionist of the cafe addresses Toya as owner, and Toya then asks Rebecca how the cafe is going. Rebecca mentions that it's going very well, and the girls also seem full of life now that they have found jobs. Toya then explains that this business idea came to him on a whim, and he mass-produced bicycles in the workshop, and sold them to a trader to gather money for opening this store. Rebecca then mentions that the books that Linza brought for them has been especially popular with women, and Toya mentions that it's great as buying books costs a lot of money. Will then asks Toya if he made all the furnishing here himself, and Toya mentions that he did. Will states that it must be nice to be able to use null magic, and he states that his grandpa was also able to use it, but he doesn't have any affinity for it. Toya then asks Will what kind of null magic his grandpa had, and Will mentions that he had the spell called gravity which let him make anything he touched heavier. But it only made things a tiny bit heavier so there wasn't much use for that spell. Toya mentions that he shouldn't say that, and depending on how it's used it might turn into an ultimate spell. The scene changes to Toya and Yumina visiting the guild, and Yumina mentions that she also wants to have a red guild card like everyone else. Toya then notices a bloody crab slaying quest, and he takes the quest to the guild receptionist. The receptionist then asks Toya if he is the owner of the Moon Reader Library Cafe, and Toya mentions that he is. The receptionist then introduces herself as Prim, and she mentions that there is a book in the referee's Imperium called The Order of the Rose, and she asks him if he plans to stock them. Toya asks Prim if that series is already complete, and Prim mentions that it is and it has 15 volumes. Toya then mentions that he will order them, and Prim states that she will be looking forward to it. Later Yumina asks Toya if he knows what kind of book The Order of the Rose is, and Toya mentions that he doesn't know, and he asks Yumina if she knows about it. Yumina mentions that she does, and she explains that it's a story about a nation's order of knights depicting the conflict between the male-only Order of Rose, and the female only defenders of Lily, and it also follows the romance that develops between the knights within the order amidst that conflict. Toya doesn't understand how romance can blossom within the order as all the knights are guys, and he then understands what kind of book it is. Toya then mentions that he did promise Prim, so it would be wrong not to buy them. Toya is then surprised that Yumina knew what kind of series the Order of the Rose is, and Yumina mentions that she actually knows the author of these books, that's why she knew about the series. Toya then wonders if the author is someone he knows, and Yumina states that Toya wouldn't know her as she is Raleel Ren Referees, the first princess of the Referees Kingdom. Yumina then explains that the Referees Imperium and the Kingdom of Belfast have always been closely affiliated, and she has known the princess for a long time now. At some point she found herself into these things, and she ultimately began writing them herself. Toya is surprised to hear all this, and he then mentions that they should eliminate the bloody crab before buying the books. The scene changes to them facing the bloody crab, and Yumina binds the crab using earth magic. Toya then uses his new gravity spell to take down the crab, and Yumina asks him what he did just now. Toya explains that he just used a spell to double the crab's weight, and he mentions that lack of magic power must be why Will's grandpa was only able to make things slightly heavier. They then return to the guild, and Yumina finally acquires a red guild card. Toya then tells Prim that he will be heading out to buy the books now and he wonders if she could make a list of interesting titles from that genre. 
This gets Prim excited, and she discusses this with her fellow guild receptionists. They then make a list after some discussions, and they give the list to Toya. Toya then mentions that he wants to go to Bern, the capital of referees, and he asks Yumina to share the capital's memory with him. Toya then goes to a bookstore in the referee's imperium, and he gives the list to the store owner. Toya mentions that he is buying these books because his customers requested them, and the owner mentions that they have the full collection of these books, and she goes to get them. Toya then browses through some more books while the owner is bringing the books that he requested, and he thinks that he needs to buy books from the other genre as well, otherwise those sorts of books will take over the entire cafe. Toya then goes to the counter with the other books, and a girl at the counter is looking to buy the last volume of Rose Magical, but the owner informs her that she has just sold the last copy of that book to Toya, and they don't know when the next shipment will arrive. The girl asks Toya if he would let her have that book, as she has tried the other bookstores, and they were all sold out of it. Toya mentions that he came here to buy them as well, and he can't let her have it. The girl then notices that Toya is buying a lot of books in this genre and she thinks that he might be really interested in this sort of thing. The girl then takes Toya to the side, and she tells him that she will autograph every volume of The Order of Rose if he lets her have the book she wants. Toya wonders what good her autograph will do him, and the girl then introduces herself as Riel Refries, the author of The Order of the Rose. Toya doesn't believe her, and to catch her lie he mentions that it would mean that she is Princess Rileal. Rileal can't believe that Toya knows her real identity, and Toya realizes that it's really her. Rileal wonders if Toya is going to use this information to blackmail her, and steal her brother's chastity, and Toya then mentions that he only found out about it because he heard it from Yumina. Rileal then asks Toya who he really is, and Toya introduces himself, and he mentions that he is the fiancé of Princess Yumina. Princess Rileal then thinks that Yumina is a girl and according to the books Toya is buying he should be interested in boys, and she wonders if he is after the king himself. Toya mentions that he isn't, and he then states that he will have to let Yumina explain things to her. Toya then gets Yumina with his gate spell, and she explains everything to Rileal. Toya then gives Rileal the book she wanted, and he mentions that he copied it from the workshop. The scene then changes to the cafe, and Toya has stocked all the requested books. The receptionists enjoy the new books, and this makes the cafe busier than before. Toya then talks to Will, and he thanks him for teaching him that gravity spell. He wonders if Will wants his help with anything, and Will mentions that he wants to get stronger as he has someone he wants to protect. Toya then takes Will to the knights, and he asks them to train him. On his way back Toya meets Els, and she mentions that she would like to take a dip in the hot spring, and she asks Toya to take her there with his gate spell. Toya takes Els to the hot springs, and Els relaxes in the springs. Meanwhile Toya asks the owner how the business has been going, and the owner mentions that it's been going great, and they are earning more profits from the bath fees than the inn. Toya then meets Zanuck, and Zanuck mentions that he is a regular here. The owner states that he has also started recommending the hot springs to the customers visiting his clothing shop, and Zanuck mentions that he has completed another outfit design that he received from Toya. Zanuck wonders if Toya wants to see the outfit, and the scene cuts to Toya having Els try the outfit. Toya mentions that it's a present from him, and he states that she looks really good in that. Els is embarrassed to wear such a cute outfit, and Toya asks her if she will accept it. Els then stumbles due to her heels, and Toya catches her. Toya thinks that it might be better if they change the heels with normal shoes, and Els states that it's fine like this, and she thanks Toya for this present. The scene then cuts to Toya, and Yumina enjoying tea at their house, and Linza comes there with a book. Linza then shows them the book, and she mentions that this is the new series written by Riel Refries. Toya takes a look at the book, and Linza mentions that the story is about a man with almighty power who was out to take over a nation so he gets the nation's princess, and prince in his clutches one by one. Linza mentions that Riel claims to have a sudden inspiration, and according to the rumors she is writing it at a crazy pace. Listening to the synopsis Toya realizes that she got the idea from their meeting, and he gets angry at her. The story continues, and Toya tells Linza that he will be going to the Regulus Empire to buy some books. He states that this is his first time going there, so he got the memory from Lapis. Toya then goes to the capital of the empire, and he notices that the capital is in panic, and there are fires spread around it. Toya wonders what's going on, and he checks the surrounding area. 
He then notices some military men surrounding a knight, and Toya saves the knight. Toya then asks the knight what's going on, and the knight mentions that the army is revolting. Toya realizes that this is a coup, and he treats the injured knight. Toya then thinks that he should get the emperor to safety using the gate spell, and he goes towards the castle. Inside the castle Toya hears a girl cry for help, and he uses his search magic to search for her. He finds the girl, and he goes to save her. He then takes out the person trying to harm her with his paralyzing bullet, and he heals the girl with magic. Toya notices that the girl is shaking, and he thinks that she must have been frightened. Toya then tells the girl that she will be fine now, and a female knight named Carol then arrives in the room. Carol is glad to see that the princess is alright, and she mentions that this man saved her. Toya then introduces himself as an adventurer from Belfast, and he mentions that he used teleportation magic to come here to buy some things. Hearing that Toya can use teleportation magic, Carol asks him to teleport the emperor, the prince, and the princess to safety. Toya mentions that this was his plan to begin with, and the princess then introduces herself as Lucia Ray Regulus. Toya then asks them if he should teleport the princess first, and the princess states that they should save her father and brother first. Toya agrees and he thinks that the chances of the emperor being alive are really low, and the princess states that she is prepared for the worst, but she can't escape on her own. They then take Toya to the emperor's bedchamber, and they notice that the emperor is lying on the ground. They think that they were a little late, and Toya then asks General Bazar why he is doing this. The general asks Toya who he is, and Toya introduces himself, and he mentions that he is an outsider, and he will decide whose side to take after he hears why the general is doing this. The general mentions that there has never been a better time to break their non-aggression treaty with Belfast and invade them, but the emperor still hesitated to do so. Toya then asks the general if he is planning to start a war, and the general mentions that he is. Toya then states that Belfast has an alliance with Miss Mead and Ref Reese, and he asks Bazar if he will be able to defeat all three of them. Bazar mentions that he can, and he states that they didn't spend the last 20 years twiddling their thumbs. Bazar then summons a demon using magic, and Toya asks him how he was able to forge a pact with such a powerful demon. Bazar mentions that he offered the demon living sacrifices of the criminals in the capital, and Toya asks Bazar how he got enough mana to summon it. Bazor then explains that he has an artifact called the Bracelet of Absorption which absorbs magic power from others. Toya thinks that this is why his body has been feeling sluggish, and he thinks that he will be granting him more magic power if he stays here. He then tries to use a ports to snatch the Bracelet of Absorption, but it doesn't work, and the general explains that the devil has a unique trait called magic nullification, and the same unique trait lies within the one who has forged a pact with it. Toya then tries to use his gun on him, but it also doesn't work, and the general explains that he also has the bulwark bracelet, and it protects him from all kind of physical attacks. Toya thinks that this guy is too overpowered, and he notices that the emperor is still alive. Toya then teleports the emperor, the princess, and Carol to his mansion, and he mentions that he will withdraw for today, and he casts slip on the ground where Bazor is standing. This makes Bazor keep on slipping, and Toya thinks that the bracelet will eventually absorb his spell. Toya then also uses illusion magic to make him see bugs around him, and he leaves with his gate spell. The scene cuts to Toya's mansion, and he states that he has already used healing magic on the emperor, and the rest is up to the doctor. Els then asks Toya how he always ends up getting in trouble, and Toya mentions that he doesn't know that. Toya then mentions that there are over 10,000 soldiers in the capital, and there are only a thousand knights. Yumina mentions that this is a terrible situation, and Ye states that they need to do something about it. Toya then mentions that he already has an idea, and he states that he doesn't like tormenting someone, but he has no choice. Lucia then tells Toya that the emperor will be fine if he keeps resting. Toya thinks that this is good news, and she asks Toya to call her Lou. Toya agrees, and Lucia states that this makes her happy. Toya then notices that Yumina is spying on them, and she introduces herself to Lucia as the first princess of Belfast, and Lucia also introduces herself. Yumina thinks that Lucia must have had a terrible experience due to all this, and Lucia states that Toya helped her escape this crisis. Yumina mentions that she is happy to hear that her fiancé was able to help, and Lucia is surprised to hear that she is Toya's fiancé. Toya then mentions that he will be heading to the castle to report to the king, 
and Yumina then asks Lucia if she is also in love with Toya. This startles Lucia, and she tries to deny it, but she does think that Toya is a reliable and strong man. Yumina understands her feelings, and she thinks that they would get along nicely. Yumina mentions that she has some things to discuss with her regarding this, and she asks to talk to her in private. The scene changes to the palace, and Toya tells everything to the king. The king mentions that he didn't expect to receive both good and bad news today, and he states that Yumina will soon be getting a younger brother or sister. Toya congratulates the king, and the king mentions that he has mixed feelings about this, as he was hoping that Toya would succeed him. Toya mentions that if he has a son, then it would only be right for him to inherit the throne. The king then asks Toya if he would inherit the throne if it's a girl, and Toya mentions that he never said that. The king then mentions that he understands Toya's plan to defeat General Bazor, and he asks him to proceed with it. Toya then goes to the workshop to make preparations for the fight, and Rosetta then mentions that both the bracelet of absorption and the bulwark bracelet were stored in the Babylon storehouse, and Toya wonders if they leaked out. Rosetta mentions that there is a chance of that happening, and she states that the caretaker of the storehouse is very clumsy. The scene changes to Toya's mansion, and we see that the emperor has woken up. The emperor then thanks Toya for saving them, and he states that the uprising was caused due to his weakness. Toya then asks the emperor what he is going to do now, and the emperor mentions that he has to find a way to defeat Bazor. Toya then states that he already has a plan, and he can reclaim the capital tomorrow. The princess then asks Toya if he could look for the prince before handling the general, and Toya then asks the princess if the prince has any unique features. The princess can't think of any unique traits, and Toya then uses the recall spell to see Lucia's memories. Toya then mentions that he met the prince in the capital, but he left him behind as he didn't know that he was the prince. He then uses the search spell to look for him, and he gets a hit. He asks the emperor if he knows what this place is, and the emperor mentions that this is General Romero's mansion, and General Romero was always at odds with Bazor, and he is most likely keeping the prince safe. The princess is relieved to hear that her brother is safe, and she thanks Toya for conforming his safety. The emperor then asks Toya if he is sure that he will be able to handle the capital by himself, and Toya mentions that he will manage as he has powerful allies on his side. The scene then changes to the capital of Regulus Empire, and Toya tells Els, Yay, and his familiars to suppress the army, while he tells Yumina, and leans it to provide cover fire with magic and guns. He states that he will take down the demon and the general, and they all then follow his orders. The general then summons the demon, and Toya attacks it with his sword. Toya increases the weight of his sword at the time of impact, and this defeats the demon. Toya then goes to face off against the general, and the general mentions that he still has the magic nullification skill. Toya then takes out a glass chamber from his storage, and he mentions that there is a sludge slime inside the chamber. He explains that a sludge slime produces extremely foul odor after dying, and the slime inside the chamber has been dead for an hour. He uses gate to teleport Bazor inside the chamber. Soon Bazar loses consciousness because of the foul odor of the slime, and the scene changes to the emperor broadcasting a message in the empire with the help of Toya's smartphone. The emperor mentions that they have quelled the uprising, and they have also captured the person behind it. He apologizes to the people for failing to protect them, and later we see that the prince has reunited with his family. Toya then returns to his mansion, and Princess Lucia thanks Toya for helping her. The girls then mention that Toya smells bad, and he states that it must be because he touched the general while retrieving the bracelets. The girls then mention that the slime strategy was really disgusting, and Toya states that he didn't have any other choice. The story continues, and Toya is visiting the Regulus Empire with the King of Belfast. The King of Regulus thanks Toya for saving them, and he mentions that he would like to repay him somehow. Toya states that there is no need for that. The king of Belfast mentions that Toya answered the same when he tried to grant Toya a title in Belfast, but it was fortuitous that he accepted his daughter. The king of Regulus then asks Toya if he would accept his daughter as well, and he mentions that if Toya marries the princess of both Regulus and Belfast then it would strengthen the alliance between the two nations. Toya tries to deny it, but Yumina intervenes, and she states that she agrees with Lucia becoming Toya's fiancé. She mentions that she has already confirmed Lucia's feelings for Toya, and she has also secured the agreement of the other fiancés. The king can't believe that this has already been discussed in such depth, 
and he asks Lucia if she is sure about this. Lucia mentions that she is, and the scene cuts to Lucia meeting the other fiancés. Toya tells the king that he will have to wait until he is 18, and only then he will marry her. The king states that he is fine with it, and this would mean that Belfast and Regulus could make an alliance of equal standing. Toya then wonders why this happens every time, and Leon mentions that this is because Toya's power has grown strong enough to sway the balance between nations. He states that Toya would just be a threat to other nations if he sides with a single one, so no one can overlook him anymore. The king of Belfast then mentions that they should take this opportunity to officially announce Yumina and Lucia's betrothals to the public, and for that to happen they would need for Toya to have a fitting status of his own. The king of Belfast mentions that after talking with the king of Regulus he has decided to cede portions of land from both the nations to him. Toya wonders what this means, and the king of Regulus states that this means that Toya will be founding his own nation at the border of Regulus and Belfast, and he will take the crown as the ruler of that nation. They mention that they may be calling it a nation but it's a land with no residence, and since it would be an independent nation, he would be free to do as he wants. The kings think that this would solve the issue of his status, and he would be able to marry the princesses without a problem. Toya thinks that this is too much but he knows that the kings have already laid the groundwork for it, and he agrees to their proposal. The scene cuts to Toya's mansion, and the girls think that it's amazing that their husband is going to be a monarch. They ask Toya what he is going to name his nation, and Toya mentions that it would be named the Duchy of Brunhild. They ask Toya if they would be moving to this new country, and Toya mentions that he isn't planning on doing that. Ye states that it might be fine for now, but they will have to move there at some point. Toya wonders why, and Els mentions that soon they will be announcing Yamina and Lucia's betrothal to Toya, and if he stays here, it would look like he is favoring Belfast. Toya understands, and he wonders if he should teleport this whole mansion over to Brunhild. Linza thinks that it would be better to leave this mansion as a base of operations in the capital, and it can be the embassy of the Duchy of Brunhild. Toya then thinks that they would need to build a new place to stay in Brunhild, and Lucia then shows up in her new outfit. Toya thinks that the outfit looks great on her, and Linza then asks Lucia what kind of home she would like to live in, and Ye mentions are they are talking about building a new home in the new nation. Lucia mentions that they should build a castle, as Toya is going to be the ruler of the nation, and Toya makes a search for castles in his smartphone. Toya thinks that he has no idea how to make one of these, and Rosetta then comes there, and she mentions that it's time for her to show what the workshop can really do. The scene changes to the workshop, and Rosetta mentions that the workshop also has automated customization functions, and it can scan any target and customize it to their liking. Toya then wonders how they are going to create a castle, and Rosetta states that they will make the parts here, and teleport them to the plot of land, and then assemble them. She states that it should be completed in three days, and they can start the construction once they have all the materials. Toya wonders what materials they are going to need and Rosetta tells him a long list of material that are needed. Toya thinks this is too much, and Lucia then wonders if they can use old materials. Rosetta states that they can, and Lucia then mentions that they can use an abandoned castle in the northern region of the empire for the materials. Toya thinks that this is a great idea, and the scene cuts to the castle being completed. Toya can't believe that it was finished in just three days, and the girls think that this is lovely. Rosetta mentions that she has accommodated all of their request, and the girls go inside to check out the castle. Lean then comes there, and she mentions that she was shocked to find out that Toya has become a monarch. Toya then wonders why Lean is here, and Lean mentions that she is here as the ambassador of Ms. Mead. Toya then mentions that she was supposed to be posted to Belfast, and Lean mentions that she dumped that on someone else's things seemed more interesting over here. Later Toya makes a teleportation gate that anyone can use, and he tells Ren to test it out. Ren tests out the gate, and she heads to the Belfast mansion. The gate works fine, and at the mansion Ren finds a letter from the palace. The scene changes to the palace, and Toya meets the king of referees called Rig Rick Referees. The king mentions that he has heard a lot about Toya, and he states that he would like to forge friendly relations with his country. Normally he would ask him to marry his daughter but she has already been promised to someone else. Toya is glad to hear this, and the king of referees mentions that he has heard that the construction of Brunhild Castle is complete, and he wonders if Toya is planning to invite the other rulers. 
Toya asks the kings what their real motive is, and the kings mentions that they just want to relax and let loose. Toya then returns to his castle, and he thinks that he will need to prepare for the kings. He prepares billiards, a bowling alley, ping pong, and some other games so that the kings can enjoy themselves. Toya then wonders what to do about security, and he thinks that he has already set up a spell to paralyze anybody who tries to use attack magic inside the castle, but he will need to make things more secure if he is bringing monarchs here. Cecile then tells Toya that he has a visitor, and Toya goes to meet them. He notices that the visitor is Tsubaki, and he asks her if she is here on a mission. Tsubaki mentions that she is no longer a Takeda Shinobi, and she has made her way here hoping that she might be able to serve him. Tsubaki explains that after Toya saved the Takedas, the new lord took over, and he neglected the populace. He raised taxes, interfered with other territories, and did whatever he pleased. Kusaka tried to admonish him, but he didn't listen, and in the end his land was taken away from him. After this the four elites of Takeda held a council, and they all decided to serve Brunhild with the rest of their clan. Toya thinks that it would be reassuring to have more allies, and he asks Tsubaki how many members does their clan have. Tsubaki states that they have 67 members including children, and Toya thinks that he can't afford to hire everyone to work in the castle. Tsubaki states that Toya doesn't need to worry about that as members of the shinobi clan generally have side jobs as well. Toya then meets the elite four of Takeda's, and they thank him for welcoming them. Toya mentions that he was looking for extra hands for their new country, and the Elite Four mention that he can leave the wars and guarding the castle to them. They think that it's impressive that Toya has become a monarch, and they warn him to not make the same mistake as their lord. Toya asks them if Kusaka is around, and he mentions that he wanted to ask him about some things. Toya then meets Kusaka, and he asks him how he can attract merchants to his country. Kusaka mentions that they would first need to develop roads, and he then tells him about the other things that he needs to do. Toya then starts to follow Kusaka's advice, and his nation starts developing. We then see that Lucia is working in the castle, and the other girls tell her that she doesn't need to work that hard. Lucia mentions that she just wants to learn a lot so she can be of help to Toya, and she thinks that Toya has been busy lately. Toya then thinks that his nation is finally starting to take shape, and Lucia brings a lunchbox for him. Toya then opens the lunchbox, and Lucia mentions that she heard from Yumina that Toya likes food from Ishin, and she asked Tsubaki to show her how to make them. Toya tastes the food, and he thinks that it tastes amazing. Lucia is glad to hear this, and the scene then cuts to Toya inviting the other monarchs to his castle. He shows them the entertainment room, and everyone has fun playing with each other. Leon thinks that he never thought that he would see all the western monarchs enjoying themselves in a single room and this seems like a dream. Everyone enjoys themselves in the entertainment room, and the day turns into night. Toya mentions that he has prepared one last form of entertainment for everyone to watch, and he then shows them a firework show. Everyone enjoys the show, and Lucia tells Toya that she has learned a lot of things since coming here, and ever since she met him every day has been a lot of fun. Toya then gives Lucia an engagement ring, and this makes Lucia happy. Toya then thinks that they might look like friendly siblings right now, but in time they will look like lover, and then a married couple. The story continues, and we see that Toya and his group are in a snowy cave. They are exploring a mysterious object frozen in ice, and they mention that they heard about this from a traveling merchant of Elfraz. They wonder if this is a teleportation circle to Babylon, and Toya then mentions that he has found the entrance. He tells the others to wait here, and he goes inside. He notices the teleportation circle inside, and he hopes that this leads to either the library or the hangar. He then uses the teleportation circle, and he is teleported to a part of Babylon. The administrator of the facility introduces herself as Belle Flora, and she states that this is the alchemy ward. Flora mentions that since he has made it here, it means that he has an affinity for all the attributes just like the professor, but she can only grant him the permission to use the alchemy ward once she knows that he is compatible. Toya states that he knows, and he mentions that he has already been recognized by the administrators of the workshop and the garden. Flora is surprised to hear this, and she states that it's been 4,907 years since they saw each other. Flora then takes Toya's test to find out if he is qualified, and she puts his hand on her breast. The scene cuts to Flora registering Toya as the owner of the alchemy ward, and she states that he has passed the test with his earlier boob grab. 
if he had turned into an animal and attacked her over that then she would have deemed him unqualified. She states that she looks forward to serving him, and Toya thinks that something was really wrong with the professor that made them. Flora then shows Toya the alchemy ward, and she states that here Toya can use magic and differing substances to create new things. For example, he can make a healing potion, and she mentions that the alchemy ward also functions as a medicinal facility, so it's also possible for them to regrow an arm or a leg. She states that they also have a variety of medicines in stock, and some of them were created by the professor herself. Toya is surprised to hear that the professor was actually doing research, and Flora tells Toya about the medicines they have. She states that they have sensitivity enhancers, arousal stimulants, stamina enhancers, lust enhancers, and much more, and none of them have any side effect. Toya is disappointed to hear this, and he asks her if they have any normal medicine. Flora states that they don't and the scene cuts to Toya bringing the others to the alchemy ward. Lean is disappointed to hear that it's not the library, and the other girls then notices that Flora's boobs are really big. Yumina and Leisha are depressed to see this, and Ye tells them that they still have time to grow. This cheers them up, and Els and Leanza thinks that they don't have time to grow. Lean then mentions that Toya can fondle them, and Toya states that he can't. Flora states that Toya fondled her breasts, and he even kissed her. The other girls then mention that they need to talk to Toya, and they are angry with him. Toya then merges the alchemy ward with the other parts, and the scene cuts to him searching for a new spell in his castle. He finds the spell called Fly, and he states that he can use this to make himself fly. He mentions that it consumes a lot of magic power, but he should be fine. Toya then tries to use the Fly spell, and he starts to float. At first it is a little hard for him to control the spell but with practice he keeps getting better at it, and he starts enjoying himself. The scene then cuts to him resting on El's lap, and we find out that he used too much of his mana. Els then asks Toya if she can fly as well if he casts the fly spell on her, and Toya states that he can't cast the fly spell on other people, but she might be able to fly if he combines the spell with levitation. He mentions that levitation can make objects float up to the height of the caster's arms, and he then uses levitation in combination with fly, and we see that Els can now fly as well. Toya then mentions that now they can fight flying monsters on equal terms, and he states he won't have to worry if another flying phrase shows up. Toya then practices his flying magic some more, and he flies over his town. He notices that some people are coming into his town, and Toya remembers that he started recruiting for his own order of knights. The people mentioned that they would serve him from this day, and Toya thinks that this will be an interesting order of knights. Toya then receives a call from God, and it's the love goddess on the line. She mentions that lately Toya has been in full romance mode, and she states that since he has established his town, he was thinking of settling things with his fiancés. Toya tells her to not read her mind, and the love goddess states that she can't help it as her antenna picks up anything love-related. The love goddess then tells Toya to go on and announce his relationship to Els, Linza, and Ye's parents. The scene cuts to Toya visiting Ye's parents and they give him the permission to marry her daughter. Toya states that this was quite easy, as he thought that his father would say something like he would have to defeat him if he wanted to have his daughter. Ye's father mentions that they can still have a match, and he states that it would be fun to learn how strong Toya is. Ye states she won't allow this, and she mentions that he would have to fight her instead, as she can't afford to put Toya in danger. Ye's mother then states that Ye really does love Toya, and she tells Ye's father to stand down, and they are both happy that their daughter has found a wonderful partner. The scene then changes to Toya visiting Linza and El's house, and their uncle bows to Toya, and he asks him to forgive them. Their uncle's daughter tells Toya that her father is weak around people with nobility, as something happened to him when he was a child. Toya then tells him to raise his head, and El's aunt states that he is quite humble for a monarch. Toya states that he just became a monarch, and El's aunt mentions that she was worried when she found out that they were marrying a monarch. She states that Toya seems like a nice man, and she can see why the girls spoke highly of him in their letters. One of their uncle's sons wonders if Toya is strong, and he asks him if he can beat a thunder bear. Toya asks their aunt if there are thunder bears here, and she mentions that they have been spotted recently. Toya states that they are quite dangerous, and he mentions that he will take care of them. The scene changes to Toya presenting the Thunder Bears to the guild, and he has hunted down so many that the guild needs some time to count them all. Toya then waits at the guild, and he then meets Ende. 
Toya mentions that he has a lot of questions for him regarding the phrases, and he asks him what they are. Ende mentions that he can't tell him everything, but he will try to tell him all that he can. Ende then mentions that the phrases are not creatures of this world, and they are looking for the king that leads them. They are here to search for the said king's core, and Toya asks him why they attack people. Ende states that the core is inside of a person, and it emits a unique sound, but the phrases can't hear the sound because of the heartbeats of humans. Therefore, they kill the humans to eliminate the interfering noise. He states that seeking the king is instinctual to them, and they are not even aware that they are invaders. Toya then wonders if the reason was the same 5,000 years ago, and Ende states that it was, and back then someone repaired the fraying barrier to subside the threat of the phrases. He mentions that even he helped out in exterminating them, and he states that now the barrier has started fraying again, and it's only a matter of time before advanced phrases come here. Toya asks Ende if he is also killing people to search for the core, and Ende states that he isn't. Toya asks Ende if he is an ally to mankind, and Ende states that he is just hunting the phrases to buy some time until the core is transferred to another world. Ende then leaves and Toya thinks that their only way of fighting the phrases are the frame gears. The scene cuts to Toya visiting the workshop, and he asks Rosetta if anyone can pilot a frame gear. Rosetta states that they can with proper training, and Toya then asks if they can use the workshop's copy function to mass produce them. Rosetta states that it would be difficult as it requires a ton of materials, and it would take an entire day to produce a single one. Toya states that this is bad, and he asks her how many frame gear they have in the hangar. Rosetta states that there are about four to six units of each attribute, and Toya wonders how they were planning to fight a war with so few of them. Rosetta states that the phrases disappeared when they were about to begin mass production, and Toya thinks that right now all they can do is gather materials, and look for the other Babylons. The scene then cuts to Toya trying to summon a creature to help him look for the other Babylons, and Sango tells him that he should summon the Flame Emperor, as she can summon thousands of birds at once. Toya wonders what the Flame Emperor is like, and Kahaku mentions that she is a calm person despite her powers. Toya then summons the Flame Emperor, and the Flame Emperor greets the other emperors. Kahaku tells the Flame Emperor that Toya is their master, and the Flame Emperor agrees to form a contract with Toya. Toya then forms a pact with it, and he names the Flame Emperor Kugyoku. Toya then tells Kugyoku to search for the remaining parts of Babylon, and Kugyoku sends numerous birds to search for any suspicious buildings or ruins. The story starts with Toya waking up in bed with Yumina, and he wishes that this could last forever. He then wonders what Yumina is doing here, and he thinks that he went to bed by himself last night. Yumina then wakes up, and she wishes Toya a good morning. Toya asks her what she is doing here and Yumina states that there is nothing wrong about a husband and wife sleeping in the same bed. Toya thinks that it's true, but they are not married yet, and Yumina mentions that lately Toya has been too focused on the nation to spend any time with her, so he owes him this much. Yumina then states that it's almost time for the breakfast, and she leaves after kissing Toya. Later Toya talks about this with Kahaku, and Kahaku states that having five wives must be tough. Kugyoku then comes there, and she informs Toya that she has received word from the scouting birds. She states that they have found a black pyramid made out of unusual materials, and Toya asks her where the ruins are located. The scene then cuts to Toya briefing the girls about the situation, and they notice that the ruins are on an island located west of Sandora. They mention that this is going to be their fourth Babylon, and Toya hopes that it's either the storehouse or the hangar. The girls then make a bet on what it's going to be and Toya remembers that Ende told him that advanced phrases will be coming soon, so he hopes that they can obtain the frame gears soon. The scene then cuts to the group on the island, and they notice that there is not a single person living on the island. Lean states that this could mean that the island is filled with many wild monsters, and they then hear something. All of them take fighting positions, and a monster then charges towards them. Toya tries to shoot the monster, but Yumina beats into it, and the other girls then work together to take out the monster. Toya doesn't get to do anything, and he thinks that he will take out the next one. But he doesn't get any chance to attack the subsequent monsters as well, and he gets disappointed. Paula then shows Toya the ruins, and Toya enters inside. He notices that there is a teleportation circle inside, and he informs everyone that he will be teleporting now. Toya then teleports and he is attacked by a girl. 
The girl mentions that this is the first time someone has dodged her instant kill attack, and Toya asks her who she is. The girl introduces herself as Fred Monica, the administrator of Babylon, and she asks him who he is. Toya introduces himself, and he mentions that he is already the master of the garden, the workshop, and the alchemy ward. Fred Monica then asks him to prove his strength to her, and she tries to attack Toya, but Toya makes her slip using his slip spell. Toya then sees her panties, and she asks him if he saw them. Toya states that she is too young to wear black, and Fred Monica then attacks Toya again, and he uses a shield to deflect her, and he sees her panties again. Fred Monica then gives up, and she kisses Toya, and she registers him as the master of the hangar. Toya is happy that he has finally found the hangar, and he asks Fred Monica to show him the frame gears. Fred Monica takes him to the hangar, and Toya thinks that it's quite spacious. Fred Monica explains that spatial magic is used on the interior of the hangar to make it a lot bigger inside. Fred Monica then tries to open a hangar shed, but she is too small to reach the button, and she uses her wrench to break it open. Toya then sees the frame gear, and Fred Monica mentions that this is the original frame gear so it's an older model. Toya wonders if he can get inside it, and Fred Monica states that he can, but it won't run. Toya asks her why, and she mentions that it's because it has no fuel. She explains that the frame gear uses ether liquid for fuel, and she states that the administrator of the research lab can make it. Toya is disappointed to know that they have to find the research lab to make it run, and Fred Monica states that Flora might know how to make the fuel. The scene cuts to everyone at the alchemy ward, and Flora mentions that she can make ether liquid, but it will be inferior to what the research lab administrator could make. Toya states that it won't be a problem, and Flora then asks him if he has any ether ore. Flora explains that it is an ore with the ability to amplify, store, and release energy, and they would need a large amount of it. Linza wonders that Flora is talking about spellstones, and she shows her a spellstone. Flora states that this is an ether ore, and Toya thinks that they just have to find a big spellstone. The girls inform Toya that spellstones are quite rare, and they have never seen a big spellstone. Toya gets disappointed, and Ye then suggests that Toya's smartphone might be able to find a big spell stone. The smartphone locates several big spell stones, and there is also one in Brunhild. Toya then mines the spell stone, and he gives it to Flora. Flora thinks that this will do, and Toya then thinks that in a month the ether liquid will be complete, and he will be able to pilot the frame gear. Rosetta and Fred Monica then show up there, and they mention that they are doing some light maintenance. Rosetta states that even though the hangar is equipped with magic that prevents corrosion and deterioration, dust can still build up. Rosetta then asks Toya if he would like to try sitting in the pilot seat, and Toya is excited to do so. The scene cuts to Toya sitting in the pilot seat, and Rosetta explains that with practice and understanding of the machine Toya will be able to pilot it easily. Fred Monica states that the unit handles all the detailed adjustments and assistance by reading the pilot's mind, and its functionality is also dependent on the pilot's thoughts and experiences. Toya then thinks that he can't wait to be able to pilot it, and he thinks that it will take him some time to get used to it. Rosetta states that she knew that something like this would happen so she made something in private, and she shows Toya a simulation unit to help with frame gear piloting practice. Toya then gets inside the simulation device, and Rosetta starts the simulation. Toya tries running and jumping in the frame gear, and he then notices that another frame gear is in front of him. The other one is piloted by Fred Monica, and she states that they should test its combat prowess. Toya and Fred Monica then fight using swords, and Toya defeats Fred Monica. The scene then cuts to Brunhild Castle, and Toya has made copies of the simulation device for all of his fiancés. He tells them to practice using the device whenever they are free, and he states that eventually he will make them available for everyone in the castle. He thinks that during that time they can also work on the mass production of the frame gears, and they should have enough of them in a few months. He thinks that he will name the mass-produced model Chevaliers, and right then Sue arrives there. She asks Toya to make her his wife, and Liam then stops her from troubling Toya. Toya then asks what's going on, and Liam mentions that Sue has received an offer for an arranged marriage. Toya then asks her who her partner would be, and Liam mentions that it would be Prince Sabune, the first prince of Linhea. Toya thinks that this doesn't seem like a bad arrangement, and Sue states that she won't wed some mysterious man. Liam agrees, and he explains that Prince Sabune has a bad reputation, especially in his relationships with women. 
Countless noble ladies have been brought to tears because of his violent and awful treatment, and according to rumors this is why he hasn't been allowed to succeed the throne despite being over 30 years old. Toya then states that their ages are too far apart if he is over 30 years old, and Lin mentions that the prince claims to have fallen in love with her at a social party. Su mentions that she won't marry that idiot prince, and she asks Toya to marry her instead. Toya states that he is also opposed to Su marrying that idiot prince, but this is a matter between nation, and he can't resolve it at his own discretion. Toya then consults the other girls about this matter, and they mention that they don't mind Toya marrying Su. Toya states that they should focus on how they can refuse the prince's proposal, and Su states that she can just turn him down by telling him that she is going to marry Toya. Lim states that there could be some problems, and he mentions that the prince might sever all connections between their nations. Su states that she can't create more trouble for the others, and Toya mentions that he should visit the duke, and they might be able to figure something out together. The scene cuts to Toya talking with the duke, and the duke states that he has also been worried about this matter for quite some time. Toya asks the duke if the prince has such a bad reputation, then why hasn't he been expelled from the royal family? The duke states that it's because of the power of Prime Minister Wardak of Linhea, and he explains that the Prime Minister holds all the authority in Linhea, and according to the rumors the king is just a figurehead. The duke mentions that the Prime Minister is from the same family as the Queen Daisha, and the prince uses this status to get away with whatever he does. He has heard that the only decent person in the family is the second prince, but he is the son of a concubine, and he has been forced to live away from the palace in shame. The second prince's mother is kept isolated due to an illness, and she has no backing. The second prince can barely manage to keep her alive, and Toya thinks that this is tragic. Lin then informs them that an emissary from Linhea has arrived, and the duke states that he has made up his mind to formally decline the proposal. The duke then meets with the emissary with Toya, and duke states that he is honored to receive their proposal but he will have to decline, as his daughter has already settled on another man. The emissary asks who the man is, and the duke states that it's Toya the Grand Duke of the Duchy of Brunhild. The emissary then bows down to Toya, and he states that he has heard a lot about his achievements. He then asks Toya if he can use teleportation magic, and Toya states that he can. Knowing this the emissary asks Toya to save his mother, and he introduces himself as Cloud Zeph Linhea, and he is the second prince of Linhea. The story continues with the second prince of Linhea asking Toya to help him in saving his mother, and he mentions that the others say that her mother is being kept isolated due to her illness, but the truth is that she is being held a prisoner by Prime Minister Wardock. Toya wonders why the king hasn't done anything about this, and Cloud states that the king is afraid that he will be killed if he opposes the Prime Minister. Toya then asks Cloud if this marriage proposal was just a way to speed up his plans, and Cloud explains that the Prime Minister intended for Zabune to inherit the throne after his engagement with Su was announced. Toya then thinks that Wardock must have chosen Su because she is too small to oppose him, and the Duke then mentions that they should hold an urgent summit of the Western nations regarding this. Toya can't believe that this issue is that big, and the scene cuts to them having a summit of Western nations. The King of Reglies mentions that it's good to have the second Prince Cloud succeed the throne, and he wonders if the nation would function properly after that. The King of Belfast then asks Cloud if he has any nobles on his side, and Cloud states that he has the support of the previous Prime Minister Marquis Coop. He mentions that the Marquis has been supporting him from the backgrounds, and Toya states that if he just wants to save his mother then there is also the option of fleeing the country. Cloud states that he has already seen so many people suffer because of the First Prince and the Prime Minister, and he would like to do something for them if he is given the chance to. Everyone then agrees to help Prince Cloud, and Toya thinks that now they just need to come up with a plan to overthrow the Prime Minister. He states that he would like to avoid using physical force, and the kings dump all that onto Toya. The scene then cuts to Toya visiting Linhea with gate and invisibility magic. Cloud states that the invisibility magic is great, and he can't tell where Toya and the others are. Cloud then goes to see the first prince, and Zabune mentions that it's unusual for an idiot like Cloud to return this soon. Toya then notices a woman wearing a slave collar, and Zabune asks Cloud how the duke responded to his proposal. Cloud states that the duke's daughter was already engaged to someone else, and Zabune slaps Cloud, and he states that he should have just kidnapped the duke's daughter. He mentions that he was planning to make her his slave anyways, and he then asks Cloud who the duke's daughter is engaged to. 
Cloud states that she is engaged to Mochizuki Toya, the Grand Duke of the Duchy of Brunhild. Zabune then asks Cloud to go back to Belfast and start spreading rumors telling the people that Toya is a womanizer who has left many women in tears. He states that this might cancel the engagement, and Cloud glares at Zabune. Zabune then kicks Cloud for glaring at him, and he mentions that Cloud needs to learn his place. The queen then comes there, and she asks Zabune how the proposal went. Zabune tells her that it was rejected because of Cloud, and he asks his mother if he can't succeed the throne without being engaged. The queen states that she will talk about it with Wardock, and they then leave. The scene changes to Toya healing Cloud in some room, and the girls mention that the first prince really made them angry. Toya then asks about the slave, and Cloud states that his brother brought her from a merchant in Sandora, even though slavery is forbidden in their nation. Toya then uses Gate to save the slave, and he removes her slave collar. Zabune then comes by the room, and he asks Cloud if he has seen his slave. Cloud states that he hasn't, and the Prime Minister then asks Zabune what's going on. Zabune tells the Prime Minister that his slave is gone, and Wardock mentions that he should just dispose of her as he didn't really need that slave. He states that he will deal with this once her body is found, and Zabune then tightens the slave collar. Zabune then states that his troubles never cease with such a useless brother, and today he even had to kill his slave. The Prime Minister then mentions that he will eventually send the second prince to the kingdom of Paluf, and Zabune states that Paluf has a queen and a noble woman who meets his taste. The Prime Minister mentions that he won't be sending marriage proposals, and the scene cuts to Toya explaining the situation to Cloud. He mentions that the Prime Minister is planning to use Cloud to declare war on the Kingdom of Paloof, and he thinks that the King of Paloof might kill Cloud in anger for declaring war on them, and else thinks that this must be what the Prime Minister is after. Toya then thinks that they should begin the operation, and they should start with saving Cloud's mother. The scene then changes to Gallia Fortress where Cloud's mother is held captive and Cloud states that this is quite a sturdy fortress, but they will have no problems invading it with Toya's invisibility spell. Toya then uses his smartphone to target and paralyze all the soldiers in the fortress, and Cloud is surprised to see this. The girls tell him to get used to this, and the scene cuts to Cloud reuniting with his mother. Toya then teleports their group to Marquis Cook's mansion, and the Marquis is glad to hear that the second prince has decided to fight the prime minister. Cup states that they have nothing to fear as now they have the cooperation of the other nations, and Toya informs Cup that he is willing to help them, but he would prefer not to resort to violence. Cup states that to end this in peace they will have to restrain the Prime Minister and strip Prince Zabune of his right to the throne. Toya states that restraining the Prime Minister won't be a problem, and he wonders if they can't just exile the Prince for all the evil's deeds that he has done. Cup states that they can't do that as the evidences of those deeds have already been crushed, and Toya thinks that he will not show any mercy to people who were trying to enslave Sue. Seeing Toya's evil look the girls wonder what he is planning, and the scene cuts to the Prime Minister finding out that Queen Aria has disappeared from Gallia Fortress. The soldier mentions that she was taken away by the second prince, and he then leaves the room. Toya then enters the room using his invisibility spell, and the Prime Minister mentions that they will have to hurry and ask the king to yield the throne to Prince Zabune. Zabune wonders what they are going to do about the war with Paloof, and Wardock states that they will have to put that off for now. Zabune then leaves the room, and Wardock states that losing Queen Ariat is a major blow, and he thinks that he should have let Zabune inherit the throne sooner. Toya then starts recording their conversation, and the Prime Minister thinks that he needs to make Zabune inherit the throne before the word about Queen Aria reaches the king's ears. Queen Daisha then wonders what they are going to do with the king once Zabune takes the throne, and Wardock states that they will make him disappear. He mentions that they will also kill Cloud and then not even a single member of the royal family would remain. Toya wonders what he is talking about as the first prince is also part of the royal family and he finds out that the first prince is actually the son of Wardock and the Queen Daisha. Afterwards he shows this video to the others, and they are all shocked to find out that the first prince is not really the son of the king. Cloud then states that he no longer needs to hesitate, and he mentions that he will fight the traitors to take back this nation. Toya then mentions that he is going to tell the truth to the greatest victim here, and he tells the king about everything. The next day the coronation ceremony takes place, and the king announces Cloud as the next king. Everyone is surprised at this, and Cloud goes on to accept his position as the next king. 
The Prime Minister then mentions that according to the traditions the first prince is supposed to inherit the throne, and the king states that this is why he is yielding the throne to Cloud. Everyone is surprised to hear this, and Toya then enters the throne room. He shows the video he made to everyone, and they all find out that the first prince is not of royal blood. The Prime Minister states that there must be some kind of mistake, and the king states that it's not a mistake, and he strips Wardock of his status as the Prime Minister. Toya then asks the king what he plans to do with these three, and the king mentions that they will be punished with the death penalty for their crimes. Zabune refuses to accept the death penalty, and he states that this is all because of Toya, and he is going to make him pay by ruining his nation and his women. This makes Toya angry, and he scares Zabune by firing some warning shots. This makes Zabune scared, and he loses consciousness. Toya then apologizes for losing his cool, and the king states that he doesn't mind as he needed to punish Zabune anyways. The king then states that he will leave Zabune's punishment to the new king. Afterwards Cloud appoints Marquis Kup as the new prime minister, and he purges all the merchants and nobles who were in cahoots with Wardok. Zabune, Wardok, and Daisha officially received the death penalty, but they were secretly sold to a slave trader in Sandora. Toya then thinks that since the matter with Linhea has been resolved he can now focus on the frame gears, and Su then tackles Toya. She states that she has heard that Toya took down the idiot prince for her sake, and she mentions that he is the best husband ever. Toya states that he never agreed to marry her, and she wonders if she is not good enough. Toya then thinks that he knows that the others won't mind it, and he thinks that he thought of Su as a sister till now, but she is a woman that he wants to protect. Toya then agrees to marry her, and this makes Sue happy. The story continues with Leon and Origa's wedding ceremony. Origa thanks everyone for attending their wedding ceremony, and Leon states that they still have much to learn and experience, so he hopes that everyone will continue to guide them. Both Origa and Leon's father then thank Toya for coming here today. Leon's father mentions that this might have never happened if it weren't for Toya bridging the gap between them and their nations, and they then take their leave. Sue then mentions that she can't wait to have their wedding ceremony, and Toya tells her to not say it out so loud, as it has still not been announced publicly. The other girls then think about their own wedding ceremonies, and Toya thinks that he will need to have six wedding ceremonies. Later Yumina tells everyone that they should cultivate their love, and she explains that seeing the wedding ceremony made her think that they should open their hearts to one another. Lucia states that she has been thinking the same thing, and they mentioned that they should go on dates. Yumina explains that they can strengthen their intimacy by shopping, attending theater, and going out together. Toya states that there is no need for that as they are already engaged, and Yumina mentions that lately Toya has been leaving them alone a lot. Elle states that she has been thinking the same thing, and Toya thinks that lately he hasn't been able to make time for everyone. Toya then agrees with Yumina's proposal, and the girls then dress up for the date. Toya is surprised to see their dresses, and Yumina tells him that they ordered these dresses from Zanuck's shop, and the designs for these came from Toya. The girls then ask him how they look, and Toya mentions that they all look really cute. The girls then play stone paper scissors to decide the order of their date with Toya, and the scene cuts to the group at the referee's imperium. Toya thinks that referees has all kinds of shops so this makes it an ideal city for dates, and Linza and Lucia then cling to Toya. Yumina mentions that they will swap when their time comes, and Toya thinks that this is embarrassing, but he is happy. They first go to a jewelry shop and Toya buys some jewelry for everyone to commemorate the day. It is then Els and Yumina's turn, and they are having some cakes. Yumina and Els feed the cake to Toya, and then it's Ye and Lucia's turn. Yumina then shows Toya a poster for a play, and Toya thinks that this play doesn't seem right for a date. Linza then states that it's not true and she explains that this is a tale of romance centered around one woman. She then explains more about the play, and Elle stops her from spoiling the story. Toya thinks that they can all enjoy a romance story, and they should go see it. Some thugs then show up there, and they threaten Toya to hand over all of his cash, and if he doesn't have any then he can share his girls with them. The girls then take care of the thugs, and the scene cuts to Toya wondering if it was all right for them to leave those thugs at the night station. Linza states that it was fine, and she mentions that they should let the people of referees handle the rest. Yumina thinks that those guys ruined their date, and Toya mentions that it's not true as they still got to enjoy the play. 
He states that he was really happy to spend time with everyone like this, and Els mentions that they are going to have more fun in the future. They all then run back home, and at the palace entrance they notice that Sue is waiting for them. She gets angry at them for leaving her behind by herself, and the next day Toya goes on a date with Sue. Some kids greet Sue as the princess, and Sue also greets them, and she informs them that she is the Grand Duchess. Toya mentions that it's not Sue's title yet, and Sue states that it's fine as one day it will be. They then have something to eat, and Toya buys her some jewelry as gift. She then also observes the knights in their training, and in the evening she states that she had fun today. She then mentions that Toya is incredible, as everyone in this country has a smile on their face. She states that he is a great monarch, and Toya mentions that he is not sure about that. Sue states that he should have more confidence in himself, and Toya thinks that he needs to do whatever he can in order to make this a nation where everyone can live happily. Kahaku then connects Toya to Flora telepathically, and Flora states that she has finished extracting the ether liquid. The scene then cuts to Toya checking out the frame gear, and Yumina thinks that it looks really impressive from here on the ground. Toya then asks Kugyoku if Ye is ready to pilot, and Kugyoku states that she is. Ye then pilots the frame gear, and everyone is excited to see it move. Toya then asks Ye how it felt, and Ye states that it was easier than she expected it to be. Lucia then asks Toya why he didn't pilot it first as he was really looking forward to it, and Toya mentions that Ye has the lowest magic capacity out of them all, and he figured that if she is able to pilot it then the rest of them shouldn't have any problems. He mentions that he will be the next one to pilot it, and he then notices that Els has started piloting it. Everyone then makes a cue to pilot the frame gear, and Toya is at the end of the queue. The scene then changes to Rosetta showing Toya her newly developed anti-phrase weapon, and she thinks that it was a good idea to make weapons out of phrase crystals. Toya states that the bodies of phrases increase in strength depending on the amount of mana poured into them, and he thought that they could make incredible weapons out of them, so he stored all the remains of the phrases in his storage. Rosetta mentions that she has made more swords and crystal bullets for him, and Toya wonders how the mass production of the frame gears are going. Rosetta mentions that it's going fine, but they are running low on Oracalcum, and later Toya wonders how he can acquire Oracalcum. He then comes across Yumina and Lucia, and Yumina asks him what he is thinking about. Toya mentions that he needs to acquire some Oracalcum for the frame gears, but he is not sure where he can get them. Yumina mentions that they might be selling it at the mineral shop, but they probably won't have enough of it. Lucia states that Oracalcum is a rare mineral, and it sells for a really high price. Toya mentions that he would like to save money considering the amount they are going to need, and he wonders if there are any Oracalcum golems in this world. Yumina states that she has never heard of one, and Toya then uses his smartphone to perform a search for them. He notices that there are quite a few of them, and he thinks that he will go and hunt some of them. Yumina wonders if he is going to leave them alone again, and Toya states that this is not his intention, but he is planning to use fly to fly there. Yumina and Lucia states that flying is a little scary, and the scene cuts to Toya flying towards his destination. From the sky he notices a burning town, and he uses long sense to notice that the town is being attacked by phrases. Toya observes that some knights lead by a female knight are fighting the phrases, but they are no match for them, and Toya then steps in to save them. He uses his new sword to take out the phrases, and he notices that there are only inferior phrases here. He then tells the female knight to evacuate the residence, and mentions that he will explain everything later. Toya then takes out all the phrases using his new sword, and the female knight then asks him if he is alright. Toya states that he is fine, and he asks her how is the damage on her end. The knight mentions that they have some injured, but there were no casualties. Toya states that it's good to hear, and he mentions that he is going to heal the injured. Toya then heals all the injured with his magic, and the female knight asks him who he is. Toya introduces himself as the Grand Duke of Brunhild, and the knight then introduces herself as the first princess of Lestia, Hildegard minus Lestia. Toya then recalls that Lestia is a big nation ruled by a knight king, and Hildegard states that she has heard of Toya. She mentions that he is the young monarch who rose up from an adventurer, and he has been resolving problems in many nations. Toya states that he is not that great, and the princess can't believe that he is also skilled with the sword. She states that she was surprised to see him defeat those monsters in a single blow, 
and Toya mentions that these monsters are called phrases, and they can't defeat them without destroying the core inside their body. He mentions that Hildegard is also good with the sword, and it's just that this time her opponent was a bad match. Toya then asks Hildegard if he can take the fragments of the phrases he defeated, and Hildegard mentions that it's not a problem as he is the one who defeated them. She then asks Toya if his sword is made from phrases, and he mentions that it is. She then stares at Toya's sword, and she mentions that it must be nice to be able to wield a sword like this. Toya thinks that she might want this pretty badly, and he thinks this is a good time to improve their relations with Lestia. He then gives her three of the swords made from phrases for her, and the royal family, and he mentions that this is to commemorate their meeting. Toya then leaves, and the scene cuts to him defeating an Orichalcum golem. He stores the golem in his storage, and he then notices a deer which leads him to an injured girl. He notices that the girl is heavily injured, and she is missing an arm and a leg. Toya then uses his healing magic to heal the girl, and the girl regains consciousness for a moment, and she then faints again. The story continues with Flora telling Toya that the injured girl he found has woken up. She states that all of her injuries including the missing parts have been healed, and Toya can't believe that Flora regenerated her body in just a day. Flora states that it's easy to do with the power of the alchemy ward, and the only problem is that the girl has lost her memories. She explains that the girl still retains common knowledge and the ability to speak and read, but all her memories about herself are gone. Toya wonders if it's an after-effect of her treatment, and Flora angrily states that it's not. She mentions that it would be a possibility if they regenerated her head, but regenerating limbs won't make anyone lose their memories. She states that if Toya still doubts her, they can try cutting off the extra part in his crotch and regrow it. Toya states that she doesn't need to do that, and he then meets the girl. He asks her name and how she got those injuries, but the girl states that she doesn't know. Toya wonders what he should do, and he hopes that she remembers eventually. The girl then asks who he is, and Toya introduces himself as the monarch of Brunhild. He mentions that he found her collapsed in the mountains, and brought her to his nation as she was badly injured. He then states that it's inconvenient for her to not have a name, and he asks her if she would like to pick a temporary name. The girl states that she would love that, and Toya names her Sakura after seeing her pink hair. The girl likes this name, and the scene cuts to Brunhild Castle. The other girls ask Toya if Sakura is still in the alchemy ward, and Toya states that he moved her to the guest rooms in the castle since she is able to walk now. He states that she is out for a stroll right now, and the girls wonder if it's alright to leave her alone. Toya states that it's fine as he is having Kugyoku keep an eye on her, and else thinks that she is awfully carefree for someone who has lost her memories. Toya thinks that she probably doesn't experience any sadness, as she doesn't remember anything to feel sad over. Els then states that she will be heading to the night's training grounds, and Lucia states that she will be going to practice her cooking, and they ask Toya what he is going to do. Toya states that he doesn't have any audiences planned for today, and the scene cuts to him in the gardens. There he notices that Sakura is singing a song, and he tells her that she has a beautiful voice. He then asks her if she likes singing, and Sakura states that she doesn't know that, but she feels like she liked it. Toya then shows her a piano, and he plays it for her. He thinks that it has been a long time since he played a piano, and he wonders that he used to play it all the time when he was a kid. Sakura tells Toya that he is really good at playing the piano, and Toya states that he thought that Sakura would enjoy an instrument like this. Sakura then mentions that she would like to hear more, and she asks Toya to play a different song. Toya then wonders which song to play, and he plays the song that Sakura was singing earlier. Realizing this Sakura starts to sing, and Toya thinks that her voice really is amazing. The both of them then put on a beautiful performance, which draws the other girls to them. The girls mention that they were enchanted by their performance, and they ask Sakura to sing more for them. Sakura agrees, and she sings some more. The scene then cuts to Toya meeting the guild receptionist in his castle, and she asks him if he is familiar with a monster called Catabelpas. Toya states that he has never heard about it, and the receptionist explains that it's a very strong monster, and it can spew poison from its mouth, but the most terrifying thing about it is its mystic eyes. She explains that those who meet eyes with the Catabelpas can't move their legs, and eventually their body turns into stone. 
She states that the monster has taken residence in the Militia Mountains, and a total of 13 adventurers have already fallen victim to it. She mentions that the damage will only worsen if nothing is done about it, and she states that she would like to request Toya's aid in defeating this monster. Toya asks her if she has talked about this with any other adventurers, and the receptionist mentions that she hasn't as the only one who can match Toya's rank is the previous king of Lestianitam, but they shouldn't rely on a man in his 70s. Toya then asks her if there is no one other than him who can defeat this monster, and the receptionist states that there isn't, and she apologizes for bringing this request to him now that he is the ruler of a nation, and she requests him to handle this for them. Toya then asks her how much is the bounty for defeating this monster, and the receptionist shows her the total reward money that they gathered from the surrounding villages. Seeing the reward Toya agrees to take on this quest, and he states that he will be fine as he can use his recovery spell to counter the petrification. He mentions that he might also be able to save the adventurers who turned into stone, and the scene cuts to Toya explaining the situation to his fiancés. They can't believe that Toya accepted the quest because of the reward money, and Toya states that he just couldn't allow the monster to cause harm to other people. He states that the reward is also important as it takes a lot of money to manufacture a frame gear. Linza then states that Catabelpas is a rare monster, and Lin explains that there aren't many Catabelpas because it's hard for them to mate. Ye wonders why, and Lin explains that both the males and females have mystic eyes, so they have to avoid petrifying each other while trying to mate. Toya then states that he will be heading out now, and he will be back by the evening. Yumina mentions that they will also be coming with him, and Toya decides to take them with him as he thinks that it won't be too dangerous. The scene then cuts to Toya giving A a sword made of Frey's crystal, and he tells her that it's named Toka. He states that this should make defeating the Catabelpas easier, and the other girls get jealous seeing this. Toya states that he is something for all of them, and Francesca then mentions that they have arrived at their destination. Afterwards the group goes into the forest, and they locate the Catabelpas using Toya's smartphone. They then find the monster, and Toya states that he has added recovery to all of the girls' engagement rings, and he tells them to stay calm even if they start to petrify. They all then attack the Catabelpas, and the Catabelpas uses its poison. Linza can't avoid the poison in time, and Toya steps in to save her. Toya then takes out his sword, and he beheads the monster, but the monster manages to petrify his legs. Toya then uses recovery to stop the petrification, and he notices that his shoes were destroyed due to it. He then wears a new pair of shoes, and Lucia then starts to petrify after looking into the dead Catabelpas' eyes, and she uses recovery. Linza tells her to calm down as the eyes of the Catabelpas continue to be effective for a while even after their death, and she tells her that she will be fine as the petrification has stopped. Lucia then uses her knives to break the stones on her legs, and she gets embarrassed with her current appearance. She then asks Toya to turn around, and Els makes him turn around. The girls then mention that the petrification even got to Lucia's underwear, and Toya can hear all this. Linza thinks that the petrification probably starts with the body part closest to the ground, and since Lucia fell on her ass it also got her panties. The girls then ask her if she has a spare pair of panties, and Lucia states that she does have a set in her storage. The girls state that it would be better if she changes it at this point, and Els tells Toya to not turn around no matter what. Toya then notices another Catabelpas in front of him, and Catabelpas petrifies Toya's legs again. Toya then informs the girls that there is another Catabelpas here, and he thinks that its mystic eyes are preventing him from attacking. He wonders if there is a way to cover those eyes, and he remembers that he read about a spell like that when he was searching for Fly, and he uses the mosaic spell to block the Catabelpas' eyes. They then take care of the monster, and the scene cuts to them reporting to the guild receptionist. She apologizes for her lack of investigation, and Toya state that it's fine as the reward money was enough for the two of them. Els then thinks that now they just have to fix the petrified people, and Toya uses recovery to fix them. The spell makes them all recover without clothes, and Toya then uses mosaic to cover everyone's eyes. The scene then cuts to the kings using the frame units to have a mock battle, and they are enjoying themselves. Toya then asks them if they liked it, and they are impressed that Toya came up with something so fun. The king of referees then mentions that he hasn't gotten any better at it since the last time, and the king of Belfast states that they could take their time practicing if they had a frame unit in their country. Toya then states that he can lend it to them, and he asks them to let their knights use it as well. 
He states that they will work hard in their training with something to look forward to, and he thinks that Brunhild might not be enough to handle large masses of phrases so he should prepare for that eventuality. Meanwhile in the Lestia Nightdom, Hildegard is sighing, and her grandfather tells her that lately she has been sighing all the time. He then asks her if the Grand Duke of Brunhild told her that this crystal sword can't be made without unique processing, and Hildegard states that he did. Her grandfather then thinks that the rumors about Brunhild possessing many mysterious weapons must be true, and he wonders what they should do about it. The story continues with Toya at the hangar, and we see that Fred Monica is doing some modifications for the frame gears. Toya is designing the commander unit of the frame gears, and he tells her to make the necessary modifications according to his design. Kahaku then telepathically contacts Toya, and he mentions that Toya has a guest at the castle. Toya wonders who it is, and Kahaku states that it's someone who is claiming to be Toya's big sister. Toya thinks that he doesn't have a big sister, and the girl Kahaku is talking about then states that she would like to talk to Toya as well. Listening to her voice Toya realizes that it's the goddess of love, and the scene cuts to the goddess of love introducing herself to everyone as Mochizuki Karen, and she states that she is Toya's older sister. She mentions that she is happy to see Toya again, and Linza thinks that they get along really well. L states there must be some situation which forced them apart, and Ye mentions that this seems like a heartfelt reunion. The other girls then state that it wouldn't be nice for them to interfere with their family time, and they take their leave. Toya then asks the goddess of love why she has descended to the surface, and the goddess states that she came here for a vacation. She explains that Toya is surrounded by so much love, and just peeking in has been enough to refresh her body and spirit, but lately her shoulders are getting stiff, so she thought that she would stay beside Toya and soak in that power of love directly to fix her stiff shoulders. She states that her shoulders are feeling better by just coming here, and Toya then asks her why she claimed to be his older sister. The goddess states that it was a spur of the moment idea, and she mentions that she will be staying with Toya for a while. Lapis then arrives there, and she mentions that a messenger from the Nightdom of Lestia arrived an hour ago to see Toya. She states that they went to watch the knight's training when they found out that Toya was away, and Toya thinks that this is to be expected from a kingdom of knights. The goddess then states that the knights are not all they are curious about, and Toya wonders why she is smiling like that. The goddess states that it's a secret, and the scene cuts to Hildegard watching the knight's train. Toya then comes there, and Hildegard mentions that it's been a while. Toya asks her what she is doing here, and Hildegard states that today she is here as an escort. Toya wonders for whom, and she mentions for her grandfather. Her grandfather then comes there, and he introduces himself as Galen Yunus Lestia, and he states that he is the previous king of Lestia, and an adventurer of the highest rank just like Toya. Toya also introduces himself, and Galen thanks him for the gift that he gave them. He mentions that he is here to do some sightseeing after expressing his gratitude, and Toya states that there isn't much to see here, but he hopes that Galen would enjoy his stay. Galen then touches Lapis's ass, and he states that she is quite a well-trained ass, and he mentions that she must not be an ordinary maid. Hildegard asks Galen to refrain from doing things like this, as they are not in Lestia right now. Toya can't believe that Galen managed to sneak behind Lapis, a member of a spy agency, and he thinks that his adventurer rank is no joke. Galen then states that he has heard rumors of Brunhild having some giant robot-like artifacts that people can pilot, and Toya states that showing them to him will be faster than explaining. Toya then shows him the frame gears, and he tells Fred Monica to show them how it operates. Fred Monica then demonstrates the capabilities of the frame gear, and Galen asks Toya how many of these frame gears does he have. Toya states that he currently has around a dozen of them, and Galen wonders what Toya intends to do with such forces. Toya then explains that the phrases are beings that destroyed the ancient civilization, and there is a possibility that the same tragedy might repeat itself. He mentions that he doesn't know when the phrases will attack in mass, but when they do the frame gears will help them protect themselves. He states that he has no intention of using them to invade other nations, and it's possible that he might lend them to his allied nations to help deal with natural disasters and giant monsters. Galen then asks Toya if he would lend them to Lestia as well if they become his allies, and Toya states that he will as long as they don't use it for war and any other illegal purposes. Galen then states that one of his reasons for visiting Brunhild was to make friendly relations with them, but he would have to speak with the current king before joining his alliance. 
Toya states that he will also need to hold a summit of the other nations to discuss this, and Hildegard then asks Toya if he would listen to her request next. Toya wonders what's her request, and Hildegard states that she wants to fight the strongest warrior in Toya's country. The scene then cuts to Hildegard fighting A, and the match ends in a draw. Hildegard states that this was an enjoyable match, and she thinks that Toya has some wonderful knights. Ye mentions that she is not a knight, she is Toya's fiancé, and Hildegard asks Toya if he already has plans to wed another. Toya states that he does, and he mentions that his engagement to Yumina and Lucia still hasn't been announced due to Queen Yule's pregnancy. Hildegard can't believe that Toya is engaged to three women, and Ye states that there are actually six of them. This surprises Hildegard even more, and the goddess of love then steps in. She mentions that Hildegard is in love, and the object of her love is Toya. Hildegard tries to deny it, and Toya states that this can't be true as they only met twice. Ye then asks Hildegard if she loves Toya, and Hildegard states that she never expected him to be engaged. Ye tells her that she was once in the same position that Hildegard is in right now, so she can understand how she feels. She states that she couldn't tell Toya how she felt when he was engaged to Yumina, but Yumina accepted her, and she states that Hildegard should also get engaged to Toya. Hildegard then states that she will become his seventh, and Ye mentions that she will introduce her to everyone later. Galen then mentions that he heard everything, and he states that he won't allow this marriage so easily. He mentions that Hildegard will have to fight him to prove her powers in combat before she can marry Toya, and Hildegard agrees. The scene then cuts to Hildegard meeting the other fiancés, and none of them opposed to her becoming one of Toya's fiancé. Hildegard asks them if they are sure that they can accept someone like her, and Sue states that there are no problems as Hildegard is an earnest princess who works hard for the sake of her people. Lucia states that this will be a good opportunity to have connections with the East and West since Hildegard is an Eastern princess. The goddess then states that now it's time to talk about romance, and she then asks Hildegard how and when she fell in love with Toya. The other girls mention that they would like to hear this as well, and Hildegard states that it happened when Toya came to rescue her from the phrases. The goddess mentions that they don't need a formal retelling, and she asks Hildegard how Toya looked in her eyes. Hildegard states that Toya was dazzling, and he seemed really cool. The goddess states that this is what she wanted to hear, and this means that Hildegard fell for Toya at first sight. The other girls then wonder what happened after that, and Hildegard states that she was constantly thinking about Toya, and she felt a deep pressure in her chest. They all state that they know what she means, and Hildegard states that when she found out that her grandfather was heading to Brunhild, she asked him to take her with him. Sue states that this just proves how much Hildegard loves Toya, and the goddess mentions that all this love talk is making her skin smooth on top of healing her shoulders. The goddess then mentions that Hildegard can be more lovey-dovey with Toya once she becomes his fiancé, and Linza states that Hildegard will have to defeat her grandfather, before that. Hildegard states that her chances of defeating her grandfather are not too high, and the girls state that she doesn't need to worry about that as they are sure that Toya will come with several good plans for her to defeat her grandfather. The scene then cuts to Hildegard fighting her grandfather, and Hildegard can do nothing but defend against him. The others thinks that she can't win without attacking, and at this rate her guard will be broken, and she will fall. Toya thinks that she can turn it around if she gets an opening, and Lucia wonders if her grandfather will give her an opening. Toya states that he won't, but he will make him. Toya then projects the picture of a swimsuit model in front of Galen, and this gives Hildegard an opening, and she defeats her grandfather. Yumina then asks Toya who was that woman in a swimsuit, and the rest of the girls also look at him suspiciously. Hildegard then tells everyone that she won, and Toya uses this opportunity to avoid the situation. Toya then heals Galen, and Galen states that he can't believe that he lost because of his own immaturity. He mentions that he has assessed Hildegard's resolve to marry Toya, and he will allow the engagement. Galen then asks Toya to take care of her granddaughter, and Toya states that he will. Galen then asks Toya who the lady in the swimsuit was, and Toya states that they should talk about this somewhere else. Yumina thinks that the lady in swimsuits had awfully big breasts, and Lucia wonders if Toya prefers swimsuits like that. The scene then cuts to Hildegard talking with the other girls, and she states that there are many questions that she would like to ask them. She then asks them what kind of people are Toya's parents, and Els states that they have never met them. 
Linza mentions that Toya doesn't like to talk about his past, and Hildegard wonders if he has some problems with his family. The goddess then states that this is not the case, and she mentions that it's just a bit hard for him to explain it to them. She states that she is sure that Toya will tell them the truth someday, and they should wait for him until then. The goddess then mentions that she understands that they want to learn everything about the man they love, and she states that she is going to tell them about Toya's first love from when he was a child. Kahaku thinks that this could turn bad quickly, and he tries to warn Toya about it telepathically, but his telepathy doesn't work, and he realizes that the goddess is blocking it. He then apologizes to Toya for not being strong enough, and the goddess thinks that she is going to have lots of fun here, as this is the season's best spot for love. The story continues, and Kugyoku tells Toya that the bird scouts have found an abandoned ruins in the southern region of Lestia. Toya thinks that it might be faster if he flies there instead of using Babylon, and Toya's fiancés then come there, and they are dressed in sailor uniforms. Toya wonders why they are wearing these outfits, and the girls mention that they heard that Toya likes these types of outfits as they are the same as his first love Shoko. Toya then wonders who told them about Shoko, and they mention that it was Toya's sister Karen. Linza then asks Toya if they don't look good, and Toya state that they look great. The scene then cuts to Toya at the ruins mentioned before, and he uses the teleportation device to teleport to a part of Babylon. He notices a tower there, and he thinks that this must be the tower. The administrator then welcomes Toya to the rampart and the tower, and she introduces herself as Leora. She mentions that her rampart happened to make contact with the tower 347 years ago, and they completed docking. She states that she understands that Toya possess all affinities, but the tower and the rampart can only be used by someone deemed compatible. Toya then states that he has already been acknowledged by the admins of the garden, workshop, alchemy ward, and hangar, and Leora states that there should be no problems then. Toya thinks that this is different from the usual pattern, and he thinks that it's good that he doesn't have to go through those extra steps. Leora then states that she will be under Toya's command from now on, and she looks forward to serving him. She then leads Toya to the administrator of the tower, and they notice that she is sleeping. Toya tells Leora to wake her up, and Leora tries to wake Pamela up, but she doesn't wake up. Leora then wonders if she can borrow some food from Toya, and Toya gives her some food that he had stored in his storage. Leora then uses the food as bait to wake Pamela up, and Pamela wakes up. She states that it's been 4,907 years since she had a proper meal, and she eats the food. She states that it was delicious, and Toya then introduces himself, and he mentions that he has already been acknowledged by the administrator of the tower, and he was hoping to get her acknowledgement as well. Pamela states that there are some conditions before she can acknowledge him, and she mentions that Toya has to provide her food to eat and a warm bed to sleep in. Toya states that he will be able to prepare those, and Pamela then acknowledges Toya as her master, and she kisses Toya. She states that the ownership of the tower has now been transferred to Toya, and she then asks him for some more food. Toya gives her some more food, and Leora then kisses him. Toya states that this was a long kiss, and Leora mentions that this was her first time kissing a man so she lost herself into it. She then explains that she used to entertain the professor at night, and if Toya wants she can do the same thing for him as well. Toya states that there will be no need for that, and the admins then give Toya a tour of the place. Leora explains that the tower is the facility that serves as the heart of Babylon, and it contains a massive reactor which draws magic particles from the air inside, amplifies it, and converts it into magical energy. Pamela states that the most impressive thing about the tower is that it only needs occasional maintenance, so it's a piece of cake to manage, and there won't be any issues even if she sleeps all the time. Leora then gives Toya a tour of the rampart, and she states that this is the central pillar of Babylon's defense. She states that it's able to deploy a defensive shield against both physical and magical attacks, and Toya thinks that the tower will be able to increase the rate of production of the ether liquid and frame gears, and they can count on the rampart for its sturdy defense. Toya then puts Pamela on a bed, and the scene cuts to Leora meeting Toya's fiancés. Leora wonders where his other wives are, and Ye states that Sue has returned to Belfast. Leora then wonders where the other two are, and Kahaku then telepathically tells Toya that he has received an urgent message from Belfast. Toya uses Gate to have Kahaku deliver the letter, and after reading it he states that the queen is about to give birth. The scene then cuts to them at the Belfast palace, and the king states that he just had a son. 
Toya and Sue congratulate him, and the king mentions that he would like for Toya to name his child. Toya then thinks for a while, and he names the child Yamato. The king likes this name, and he is happy to finally have an heir to his kingdom. Yamato then starts to cry, and the girls tell the king that he should take him to the queen. The scene then cuts to the girls taking a bath together at the hot springs, and Sue states that the people of Belfast were really excited over the birth of their prince, and Yamina states that they also received congratulations from the other nations after hearing of the king's birth, and Lean mentions that Brunhild is also going to hold a celebration as their future queen's little brother was just born. Lucia states that there are plans for setting of fireworks, and Sue explains to Hildegard that fireworks are like flowers in the sky. Els then states that she is glad that the, the baby was born alright, and Ye mentions that she was a little touched by the whole affair. Linza then thinks that they will all be giving birth to Toya's children one day, and everyone gets embarrassed hearing this. Outside the bath Fred Monica informs Toya that his fiancés are talking about having kids, and Flora states that Toya has a lot of wives so he is going to have a lot of children as well. They mentioned that the professor saw it, and they also witnessed it with the help of the clairvoyance gem, and Flora states that Toya is going to have nine children from each of his nine wives. Toya is surprised hearing that he is going to have nine wives, and Toya states that he hasn't heard about this. Francesca mentions that she has already told Lean about this, and Toya can't believe that he is going to have two more wives. He then asks them if they have discussed this with anyone other than Lean, and Francesca states that she hasn't. Toya then asks the admins to not tell anyone else about this, and Francesca wonders if Toya is going to add her to his list of wives. Pamela thinks that she can eat all she wants if she can marry Toya, and Toya states that this will never be a possible outcome. Toya's fiancés then come there, and they ask Toya what they are talking about. Toya states that it's nothing, and Yumina then asks Leora about it. Leora tries to tell Yumina about it, but Toya stops her, and he states that it's not right to blab about unconfirmed information. Ye then apprehends Toya, and Leora then explains that the professor saw that Toya is going to have nine wives in the future, and this is why Babylon was divided into nine parts. The other girls can't believe that there are still going to be more, and Toya states that they shouldn't get disappointed in him yet, as he still hasn't done anything. Linza then mentions that they should discuss this in the castle, and the scene cuts to the girls discussing what they should do to Toya. Lean wonders what sentence they will settle on, and Sakura hopes that Toya's punishment is not too painful. Yumina then tells Toya that there are already seven of them, so nine won't make any difference, and they shouldn't blame Toya when it hasn't even happened yet. But they do have an issue with Toya hiding this from them, and they state that keeping secrets is likely to cause rift between married couples. They all judged him as guilty for this, and Toya wonders what they want him to do. Yumina states that Toya will have to give them all a kiss, and she mentions that his actions left them all anxious, so it's his duty to dispel those concerns with a display of affection. Toya thinks that this is too embarrassing, and he wonders if he can put this off somehow. Toya then states that they have to prepare for the celebration of Prince Yamato's birth first, and he mentions that he will fulfill this obligation afterwards. The girls agree, and the scene cuts to Toya watching the fireworks with everyone. We see that everyone is enjoying themselves, and later Yumina states that Toya seems happy. Toya states that he understood the joy of growing a family when he saw the king with Prince Yamato, and he mentions that he doesn't have any children yet, but he has all of his future wives, and the citizen of this country, and he wants to give it his all, in order to protect all of them. Yumina then kisses Toya, and Linza states that this is not fair, and she kisses Toya as well. Sue then asks him for a kiss as well, and Toya kisses her on the cheek. Lucia states that she is next, and Toya tries to kiss her, but she gets embarrassed, and she runs away. Lean mentions that Hildegard was so nervous that she passed out, and Toya then kisses Ye. Ye gets embarrassed, and she throws Toya down. Els then lends Toya a hand to get him up, and Toya accidentally kisses her, and she punches Toya in embarrassment. Kahaku then tells Toya that the last of the fireworks are next, and the fireworks show ends. The admins then think that they are done with the fireworks, and Francesca then comes there with the clairvoyance gem. She states that talking about it made her look for it, and they all take a look at Toya's future with it. They see him marrying all nine of his wives, and this marks an end to the second season. Thanks for watching parts 1 to 12, the rest of the parts will be on my channel.
Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and make sure to hit the subscribe button, and turn on the notification bell to keep getting new anime recap updates.